But I think it's important that I start with that because when I talk about reinventing the space and we talk about the sociology of hip hop culture within the college classroom is the fact that I don't give Karl Marx, W.E.B. Du Bois or Emile Durkheim any higher place than KRS-One, Big Pun or the poet Black Ice because they are all scholars um, if, if, if you ask me. Um, but before I begin, I'd just like to thank um, you for having me here. Um, I'd like to thank all of you um, for coming out to some of the people that I grew up with. Um, you see I have... Um, Uncle Ralph on my on my slideshow, right? I try not to be starstruck, but you know, growing up um, with him and, and, and video music box is, is key. So I put him up here. You know, I saw um, Charlie Chase from the Cold Crush Brothers. I'm like, yo, do y'all even understand what's going on right now, right? This is this is this 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 is what hip hop is about and what it was um, for me. Um, so definitely, I like to thank y'all for coming out. Um, I'm gonna work and get through some of this stuff, but um, y'all heard of hip hop culture before, right? All right, so are we family? Yeah. All right, so I might switch some stuff around um, and go through some stuff. Um, that's just the nature of it. Um, just You just never know, right? Mike Tyson, a former, a famous philosopher, said everyone has a strategy until I punch them, right? <laughs> and so that's what I, I believe, right? Yeah, Mike Tyson is deep, right? And so first, before I begin, I want to dedicate this to my grandmother. Um, Albert Einstein says you don't really understand something unless you can explain it to your grandmother, right? And so my grandmother... Um, born and raised in Harlem, 2055 Madison Avenue, Lincoln Projects. Um, she did a lot for me um, and my parents, and if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here standing before you today. So I send this up to her, and hopefully she's looking down upon me and um, sending blessings my way. Right? So now, before we go on, I have to talk about a little bit of history. I am a professor. Um, and so 2013 um, is, is a big year, specifically in, in the history of the civil rights movement, right? And so we have this year the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, um, the famous march where um, Dr. King delivered his speech. We also are celebrating, or not necessarily celebrating, but remembering the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Um, it is also the 50th anniversary of the death of the civil rights activist Medgar Evers. It's the 50th anniversary of the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing where the four little girls were killed in Birmingham, Alabama. It's the 100th anniversary of the birth of Rosa Parks. It's the 100th anniversary of the death of Harriet Tubman. And lastly, it's the 150th anniversary um, since the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, right? So 2003 marked a lot of big, big celebrations that we're doing um, as it relates to civil rights, and I think it's important for us to do that. Lastly, um, I'm not sure if you heard, but Chuck D is going to be getting an honorary doctorate um, this year at commencement, I believe is at Adelphi, so we're going to have to be calling him Dr. Chuck D um, from now on. Um, and, and, and this and this is this is this is key a key moment in, in hip hop. Um, he, he's a good brother and definitely deserve it for the deserves it for the work that he's put forth. All right. And so briefly, what I'm going to talk about is my entrance into hip hop culture. I'm going to give a brief sociology lesson because we're on the on the campus, and so I'm going to be asking you questions and I need some feedback from you, right? Right. Okay. Good. All right. And so I'm going to talk briefly how I use hip hop to reinvent the classroom space, and then I'm going to talk about some challenges facing hip hop in the academy. Um, and so I'm going to show you this clip right here. This is the clip that changed my life. So after I got that, I was ready to retire, right? And so, you know, I'm talking to Africa Bambana. I was like, you know, would you do a commercial for this class I'm trying to do? And I'm, you know, had my humble voice on, um, sir, would you mind? And he was like, absolutely. And I was like, Oh, for real? And then, um, so we recorded it. So if everything I say sucks after this, it doesn't matter. Bambada supports me. Um, <laughs> let's just get that out of the way. And so these three dates, March 3rd, 1987, July 7th, 1987, June 21st, 1988. Can anybody tell me what these dates are? Take a guess. It's big. At least, it, it, again, it changed my life. Right? And so... March 3rd, 1987, BDP releases Criminal Minded. 
July 7, 1987, Eric B. and Rakim released Paid in Full. June 21, 1988, Big Daddy Kane releases Long Live the Kane, right? So I'm 11 and 12, and this is what I'm being bombarded with, right? With the dudes on 125th Street selling me the tapes. We had, y'all know what tapes are? <laughs> right? So we had tapes back then, right? And so this is where I got my, my identity from, right? So this is where I got my idea that I could be a writer, that my voice was important. It came from Rakim, Big Daddy Kane, and KRS One. And so that was my entrance into hip hop culture, right? And so in addition to that, this guy right here um, is Master Dave Thomas. He was my sensei. I did martial arts, Goju, Harlem Goju, and Lincoln Projects. The other thing that you have to know about him is he's Disco Dave from the Crash Crew. If you remember the Crash Crew, Mike and Dave Productions, and all those people, right? And so I was surrounded by hip hop culture. I didn't necessarily know it at the time, but I was being kar taught karate by, to me, who who is a hip hop legend. So I shout out um, Master Dave Thomas, Disco Dave, who is my sensei. Who could say they learn karate from Disco Dave? Come on, right? <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. And so from that point, I thought I was going to be a rapper, right? I thought it was going to be a rapper. That's right. That's me right there. D smooth, the DSM double OVE. So don't sleep on me on the MIC, right? That's what I used to say, right? And so for me, hip hop saved my life. I keep on saying that it saved my life because it did. If you think about what was going on in the height of the crack epidemic in New York City, how many people remember that time, right? And so, you know, we could have been taken out by crack. We could have been taken out by violence, by gangs, or the NYPD. Well, that's the same thing as a gang, the NYPD. All of that could have taken us out, but for somehow we're here and we made it. And so it wasn't, if it wasn't for hip hop and the ability to have this voice, I don't think I would be here with you today. And so I wanted to be an MC and make a whole lot of money. And so as you can see, my rap career really took off and I became a sociologist and I'm not making any money, right? Y'all see the difference in the dreams and in the reality. There's a difference. Right? But, that, but, that, but, that's, but that's good. And so one of the things that I want to do is we're going to have a brief sociology lesson right now. Right? Who, what is sociology? Come on, somebody tell me what sociology is. You get extra credit in whatever class you're supposed to be in right now. Sociology. What is sociology? The study of people in society. I don't know if you're a professor here or if you're a student here, but he needs extra credit, right? And so it's, it's, it's the study of, 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 of humans and it's the study of, of society, right? And so that's what, that's what I do. All right, and so I'll tell you this story really quickly. There was a fish swimming by, right? And he was talking to this younger fish. You know, he says, hey, how you doing? You know, greetings. How's the water? And they were like, what's water? Right? And so to the fish, the fish doesn't necessarily know what water is because water is just its natural environment because that's what it has to do. And so we as sociologists, that's what we do. We, we do this thing that we call making the familiar strange. Everything that's around us that we take for granted, we make the familiar strange. And that's what we do um, as, as sociologists. So like the fish would not notice that water is there. A lot of the things that happen around us, we think that it just so happens to happen. But it doesn't just so happen to happen. Something forces it and makes it happen. And that's what sociology studies, and that's what I'm using hip-hop to do to reinvent the way that we learn and teach sociology. Right? And so we talk about these social institutions. We have the legal system, the labor market, the educational system, the military, and all of this stuff. I'm going to breeze through this, right? And so we have these theories in sociology, the functionalism, conflict theory, and symbolic interactionism. And this is where the test is going to come up, right? And so if we think about conflict theory, right? This is the idea that conflict between key competing interests is the basic animating force of social change in society as a whole, right? And so if we think about the civil rights movement that I talked about, stuff didn't change because the government was like, you know what? We've been treating these people of color bad. Let's stop it and give them rights. That didn't happen, right? It came because of conflict, right? In order to get these ideas of freedom, people had to push against the status quo, right? And so that's what conflict theorists argue, that in order for society to change, there has to be conflict. Symbolic interaction is look at symbols and the meanings that people make. And so what, what, what is that symbol right there? It's the Yankees hat, but what does it mean? Like, why, why is the sticker on the hat? Huh? It's new, right? But why do we, we buy it? And we leave the sticker on. Why do we leave the sticker on the hat? Huh? Because the brand validation to show people what? It's fresh. What? It's fresh. Yeah, you got you got to have an official tissue hat, right? And is the is the brim bent or straight? straight. What happens if it's bent? Oh, it's, done. it's done, right? And so that that's what we talk about, like the meaning that people make, right? And so one day I, I was walking, in, I was going to a bar. It was when I was graduating last year. 
with my brother, right? And so, you know, we, we go in there. He has on a fitted hat with a straight brim like he's supposed to. He's from Harlem. We don't bend our brims. And so we, I go in. They let me in. He's like, he can't come in. I'm like, why can't he come in? He's like, he has the hat on. I was like, okay. So I look in the bar. And I'm like, there's a whole bunch of people with, with hats on there. And I was like, yeah, but his has a flat brim. And I was like, so, but, okay, a hat is a hat, right? He's like, well, if he bends his brim, he can come in. And we all know that wasn't going to happen, right? And so we like, so if he bends his brim, he could come in, but if it's flat, he can't come in. And so the question I ask you, like, what meaning did these people associate with a flat brim hat? Right? And so you, we understand like how racism works, right? And the, the symbols that we use to kind of reify racism comes out, right? So you can, if you come in with an Abercrombie and Fitch hat that's bent, you're good to go. But if you have on a hat and it's a, it's a flat brim, that sends a certain message that certain people are not necessarily welcome there, right? And that's a problem, right? And so that's what symbolic interaction is study, like in, 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 in sociology. We look at symbols and the meanings that people associate with those symbols. And so we understand that the sticker means that it's new, the flat brim, that's what we do. But in order to get into that establishment, it meant something different. That only certain bodies wear their hats in that way. Mainly black and Latino bodies wear their hat in this way, and we don't want them in our establishment, right? And so that's what symbolic interaction is study. Um, and that situation, absolutely problematic. Right? And so lastly, the, 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 other, the other avenue within sociology is, is functionalism, right? And so these are people who believe that everything in society has a function, right? And so there are two functions that these things have. There's a manifest function, which is the obvious function. Like, it's clear, it's obvious. And then there's the latent function, that's the hidden function, right? And so if we think about school, what is the manifest or obvious function of school? Education. Education. What else? Career path, all right. And so if we think about the latent function, the hidden function of school, what's a hidden function of school? Conditioning, Conditioning right? Conforming, understanding how to respect authority, understanding how to not necessarily be educated, but to be indoctrinated and to be in a mindless consumer, right? And so you have the manifest, the obvious function that people say schools are for education, but then you have the hidden curriculum that takes place within schools, right? And so that's what functionalists talk about within sociology. And so if we were to do the same analysis on the prison system, and manifest means obvious, what is the manifest and obvious function of the prison system? The manifest and obvious. Huh? You're supposed to rehabilitate. What else? Huh? Public safety to keep the quote-unquote bad people away from the general public. Um, you're supposed to be there serving your time and paying your debt to society, right? So that's the manifest function. So if we think about the hidden function or the latent function of the prison system, what are those functions? Free labor, Free labor right? Huh? Segregation. What else? Jobs. Jobs, right? Huh? D disenfranchisement, right? So you, so, so, you, so you can't vote, right? So there's a hidden curriculum, right? And so when we think about people who are brought here, most of us were brought here as a commodity. Right. So if you think about the history of the civil rights movement and we talk about, you know, the, the, the work of the black and Latino body within the American culture, like we were meant to work here. Right. And so as we start to get these rights and we're not working anymore, there needs to be a way for us to make some more profit off of us after building the country. I mean, that wasn't enough. We need to get more. Right. So we need to find a way to get people back into the system. Right. And so I have a cousin who's in the system. You know, they're making mattresses. They're making like long gone to this idea of, of them doing license plates. Right. Mattresses, lighting fixtures, gates and all this stuff that you would have to pay someone a living wage, about ten dollars an hour to make. But you could pay someone forty five cents an hour to do it within prison. Right. And so if you're a business person, it makes more sense to have a population that's constantly in prison in order for you to make a profit. Right. And so that's some of the stuff that we study as a sociologist. And that's the end of the sociology lesson. All right. Cool, thank you for staying with me. Right, and so when we talk about hip hop within the school space, um, first before I, I, I forgot to do this earlier, but I want to give a shout out to some of the students that I brought. If I could stand up. Right, so we have these are four of my high school students. Right, I, I teach I teach at the university. Um, I mean that's that's who pays my bills. Um, but I go into the high schools and I, and, and I work with people who people want to write off. Right. And so these young men, like, you know, the schools situate them as people who don't know how to write. But we go in there and we use hip hop and show the world that they can write. Like, they're, they're, they're LMCs. And if I have some minutes, some time after I present, I want them to spit a couple of verses for you. But so in addition to teaching at the university, I also go um, and spend time in the local high schools with the students who are our future. So they came down with me um, from Connecticut um, to be here. Yeah.
All right, and so when we talk about hip hop and we talk about academic spaces, right? This this graffiti piece is says, "Don't blame yourself, blame hip hop." Right? You you hear that a lot. It's hip hop's fault, right? You, you saw what happened with with Rick Ross. Can we talk about that for a second? <laughs> and so who who did he get dropped by? Reebok. Reebok. Reebok, right? And so people are like, "Yes, we got him," but this but it's problematic, right? Because Reebok still goes on and can exploit. Rick Ross gets dropped. Yes, what he said was wrong. He gets dropped. But then the thing that happens is that hip hop remains the scapegoat as if America is not dealing with the larger rape society and the rape culture, right? And so we get the focus again on hip hop as the, the blame of all of the social ills that are taking place while Reebok gets to go and not be critiqued. And so that's problematic. Even though it was a success to get Rick Ross dropped, that situation was actually way bigger than Rick Ross, right? And if we stop there, I think we, we dropped the ball um, with Rick Ross. Um, <laughs> all right, it's so okay. Like hip hop is often used as the scapegoat, and, and and it's problematic when we talk about the fact that students are being faced with criminalized school systems and all of the things of that nature. Um, and so I'm going to go briefly into the dominant narratives of urban maleness. Most of my work is with Black and Latino males, and I'm going to go through some stuff that talks about the ways in which we visualize these men in these academic and social spaces, right? So here it talks about living in concentrated ghetto poverty, right? And so when we have a few that act out violently to these forms of oppression, with media assistance, the implications for black men and Latino men and people of color in, that, in general is expansive. As a result, black and Latino males are assumed violent and untrustworthy simply based on their skin color. The image of the black and Latino male, male is seen with fear and suspicion. And so there's another theorist who talks about this idea of black and Latino males operating and living in a situation that is beyond love, right? And so they talk about how these males are constructed as a strange population, as a group with values and attitudes that are fundamentally different from other students. Their marginalization and oppression are understood as natural and primarily of their own doing. He argues further that black and Latino males are relatively powerless to define their circumstances and as a result are often relegated to a state of being defined by others. Right? And so this characterization of the black and Latino body in demeaning terms means that the average member of society virtually equates any one of us with trouble. We come to be seen as absent fathers, welfare mothers, lazy office worker, quota queens, and so on. Once this sets in, we have little chance of appealing to the better natures of persons who hold this unconscious image of us. This image renders us as other. It means people simply do not think of us as individuals to whom respect, generosity, friendliness, and love are due. In fact, we exist in a space beyond love. And that's problematic when we think about the ways in which we are situated within society. And so this leads to a cycle that I see within these schools, in, the, in these spaces that I'm trying to reinvent with hip-hop culture. Right? First we have this, it's probably too small for you to see, but the top one, it talks about shame. Like student bodies are being controlled in these educational spaces. Like when you come in, they're saying, pull your pants up. Why are you walking like that? Why do you talk like that? Take your hat off. Take those headphones out of your ear. What music are you listening to? That's garbage. Right? And so students are being broken down on a daily basis when they come into these educational institutions. And, right? and so all of that stuff accumulates. And so a student, if it, all of this stuff is accumulated, you're going to have an outburst. Right? And so once you have this outburst, then it leads to suspension. Right? And then so once the students are suspended repeatedly, they tend to drop out. Or rather, what I like to say, they are pushed out of school. And once students are pushed out of school, criminal activity usually is the result. Right? Because you are undereducated and underemployed until you go into the underground means of living. And then you're arrested and then you go into the prison industrial complex. And for black and Latino males, if you drop out of school, there's a 60% higher likelihood that you're going to be involved in the criminal injustice system. And that's a problem. And so the question is, we know all of these statistics, we, we hear them all the time, but how are we doing with our Kanye, right? I want to talk about our Kanye. If you remember this scene, he interrupted Taylor Swift. He's like, yo, let me take the mic. I know you're doing something, but I'm going to interrupt you. And so the question that I ask people is, what are we doing to interrupt what's happening to our students in these school spaces, right? And so simply highlighting these issues and talking about what the problem is with these black and Latino students, that's nice, but if we're not doing anything to interrupt it, then it's pointless, right? And so what are we doing to get our Kanye on 
up in this piece, right? We need to interrupt it. And so Grandmaster Cass from the Cold Crust Brothers and the documentary that Ice-T did said hip-hop didn't invent anything. Hip-hop reinvented everything, right? Hip-hop didn't invent anything, but hip-hop reinvented everything, right? And so this is what we plan or I plan that I do in the classroom space that I'm given, right? And so the first thing that I did is I'm teaching a sociology of, of hip-hop class, um, and one of the major things that we do is that the students in the class have to do a sociological hip-hop battle, right? And so we, we break students up into groups. And so you might be Team Jay-Z, your Team Nicki Minaj, your Team Lil Wayne, your Team Big Daddy Kane, right? And so you're representing your artist. And so we have rap battles. We set it up like the NCAA tournament, like in brackets. And so it's not about the lyrics that you say. You have to take lyrics from your artist, right? And so if you're Team Big Daddy Kane, you've got to take a verse from Big Daddy Kane. And that's what you're going to present. But the person who wins the battle is the person who analyzes, analyzes it sociologically, right? Whoever does the best sociological an analysis of that verse is the one who wins. The class decides by, like, screaming and yelling just like a hip-hop battle. And we go all the way down until we get to the final two teams. The other day, we just had the final between, it was Team Kanye West versus Team Little Kim. Don't ask me how Little Kim made it to the finals, right? <laughs> but she did. They did some serious analysis of, of her work, right? And so who won? It was Team um, Kanye West. It was he, they used roses versus put your lighters up. And they do this analysis. So it's not about the lyrics. It's not about the artist. But it's about how you bring a sociological analysis to that text. Because in the classroom space, it's not just the written word as far as that gets into books that are considered as sociological text, right? Hip-hop has been writing sociological critiques from, the, from its beginning, and that's what's important for us to see and showcase um, within this classroom space. And so this next piece, um, and I'm almost over, all right? This, this is from the project that we're doing at the high school. excites me, right? And so one of the reasons why we did this, we did this in the school, um, it was 40 black Latino males, um, and they talked about these were students with high risk of being pushed out, right? Some of them weren't necessarily considered to be writers, but on the first day, I was like, who writes or who spits, right? And so we, we started a cipher on the first day, and then from that point, we started to talk about the fact that they were writers. They don't necessarily see themselves as writers in the traditional sense because of the fact of the way that the schools tend to structure what it means to be a good writer. But these students are excellent writers. If you hear some of the stuff that, that they spit um, and that they, that they would share. And part of the reason why I do this is because it's important for students to be critical media literates, right? They have to be able to define their own culture because some of the stuff that we have out there is being dumped upon them and making them think that what we see on TV is what the image of a black and Latino person is supposed to be. And so not only should they, they shouldn't be mindless consumers of the culture, but they have to learn to be critical consumers, but also critical producers of their own culture and understanding that their voice does have power. And that's the work that we're doing at the, um, at the hip hop academy, right? And so, and so that, so, so, so that's key, right? And so one of the things I want to switch to before I end is just to kind of talk about what I need all of you to do. Right. I need all of you in here when you when you have professors, when you go to these conferences and you have people saying that they're doing hip hop work or they're hip hop 
education. I need you to challenge us, right? I need you to keep us accountable and hold us accountable to the work that we're doing, right? Because as everyone know, if you put hip hop in front of everything, everyone thinks that it's the sexy thing to do. Oh yeah, I'm doing hip hop, right? Grandmaster Kaz said, hip hop reinvented everything. But what I would say to that is that everything is not hip hop, right? And so we, we like to put hip hop in front of like a lot of the corny stuff that's being sold. Like if you use hip hop for this, if you do this with hip hop, you know, that's great. And it's a sexy thing to do, but everything is not necessarily hip hop. One of the other things that I want you to do is to challenge us for those who are doing hip hop in academic spaces. Because one of the problems that I have is when we do these things in academic spaces, we get to write these books and everything like that, that no one else understands, right? You use all of these big words, but no one else understands what the heck you're writing, right? You're talking about hip hop as being that's produced by the youth and it's produced by urban populations. But if I was to drop one of these books on 125th Street, a lot of people wouldn't even be able to make sense of it. And that's problematic, right? So we can't allow hip hop to be stripped from these urban spaces and the places which they, they are created, right? And so it's good that, you know, we're doing this class, Sociology of Hip Hop, at the academic level. It's good that we have in these places like Cornell archive the work, but we kind of have to challenge people and to make sure that they're being respectful not only to, um, to the people who produce the culture, but to the elements of what hip hop culture stands for. Can, so can you agree to do that with me? Yeah. To hold us accountable? Does that make sense, what, I, what, what, what I'm saying there? Yeah. Um, and so what, you know, at the end of a speech, you're supposed to have something like profound to say, and I don't, right? <laughs> but one of the things before I end, I wanted to know if I could have like five minutes um, to have some of my gentlemen like Spit a verse. Is, 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 is that okay? Yes. All right, so yeah, come up, come up. Come up. I got, I got, I got.